have a person who is extremely well known in the uh, uh, securities community, a person who, uh, uh, who teaches at Georgetown University uh, School of Foreign Services, was a uh, staff member for the 9-11 Commission, He's also a research director in Middle East policy at the Brookings Institute. He's published uh, a number of, uh, of works on, uh, on terrorism in uh, uh, publications such as the New York Times, The Atlantic, The Wall Street Journal, Foreign Affairs, and a number of other uh, scholarly and popular journals. Among his books are A High Price, The Triumphs and Failure of Israeli Counterterrorism, and Al-Qaeda, uh, What Everyone Needs to Know. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Dan Byman. Dan, thank you. Great. Uh, thank you all for coming out this evening, and thanks to, to Jack and to Ellen and everyone at the center for, for hosting me. Uh, so I'm going to talk about al-Qaeda tonight. Uh, for those of you who are hoping for a talk on the Islamic State, uh, give that as well, and I'm happy to go into that in question and answer. And in fact, the stories kind of overlap, so inevitably we'll get some of that. But um, this is a group that has been, I'll say, out of the news lately. Uh, and for my students, at least, at Georgetown, and for a number of people in this room, um, it's a historical group, right? That this is a group that you know did some uh, very, I'll say, dangerous and deadly things, but did it a while ago. Right? and has been much less active. So I'm going to tell the story of kind of how this group has risen, how it has fallen, and a lot of the changes that have come along and kind of where it might go at this present time. Uh, so say some obvious points, you know, why does it matter? Um, the big thing I would stress, of course, is 9-11 was almost 10 times as deadly as any previous terrorist attack. Right? So it's an off-the-charts attack. And just as an aside, uh, this is something that colored counterterrorism in the first several years of the Bush administration, right? where their assumption was that terrorism is only going to get worse. Right? There was a question of, was 9-11, um, we were asked at the time, is it um, a harbinger of things to come, or is it an aberration? And at the time, we would have said it was a harbinger of things to come. Um, now it's increasingly looking like an aberration. We haven't seen anything at remotely that scale. Um, what also makes this group dangerous so it gets a lot less attention, which is it's tied to lots of civil wars, especially in the Middle East, and I'll, I'll discuss some of those. Um, the last thing I'll say, though, is very is tough. It's a conceptual question. Uh, I think I can sit and say to you that Al-Qaeda at its peak, when it was most dangerous, had several hundred people who had sworn loyalty to Osama bin Laden and were members of the group. But, you know, it trained over you know, thousands of people in training camps in Afghanistan. So, you know, you probably count those people. Um, it was tied, affiliated to lots of other groups in the Muslim world that had thousands of fires of their own. So now we're getting to tens of thousands of people. Um, and it was also an idea. Right? It represents a series of ideas about how the world should work, who the enemy is for many Muslims. And what al-Qaeda is depends very much on what you want to count. Because right? if it's a group of a couple hundred, then you want to find those people and kill them or arrest them. Right? If it's an idea, then you have a lot more challenges. And all of this is true to some degree, which makes it, makes it tough. OK, let's start with, with the history. Right? So, the story that Al-Qaeda would tell you, right, if, you know, Ayman Zawahiri were here lecturing with me, he would say, the Soviets invade Afghanistan, and we, the Muslims, rushed to fight. We rushed to help. Um, and in their eyes, a relatively small group of people stood bravely, fought the Soviets, many died, and because of that sacrifice, the Soviet Union not only pulled out of Afghanistan, but it collapsed several years later. Right? So a small group of people acting as God's agent can change history. Right? And that's, a, that's an incredibly powerful transformative effect. Um, so that is their myth. Um, what I will say, though, is that the veterans of Afghanistan, they show up again and again. So if you look at jihadists who show up in Bosnia during the civil war there, who show up in Chechnya during the civil war there, who show up in Algeria and help foment a civil war there, on and on and on. Uh, 
these veterans, while small in number, are tremendously important to where the movement's going to grow and shape. It's, it's an inspiring thing when these people come back because they, they have a dream. And they're also people who have a lot of credibility. Right? They went off to fight to risk their life. They come back just, you know, in the United States, um, there's tremendous respect and appropriate respect for the veteran community. Um, imagine a war no one thought anyone could win. Right? A much smaller group of veterans. Right? That's how these people were treated. So they were treated as heroes uh, in many countries when they initially come back. Um, but a few things to note. Right? One is that there are only a few of these guys. It took them a long time to show up. Even by the mid-'80s, there were only a couple dozen there. More start to come over time. But a big thing is they were militarily irrelevant. Right? The one thing the Afghans didn't need was fighters. They had hundreds of thousands of Afghans who wanted to fight the Soviets. They needed weapons, they needed training, they needed logistical support, they needed lots of things, but not a couple hundred guys who didn't know how to fight particularly well. Right? That wasn't useful. Um, but the Arabs were valued just as a symbol of solidarity, and also because a number of them brought money with them. Right? And for some of them, it was kind of a tourist experience. Right? You get to go there, you get to fight, you get to you know, shoot at the distant enemy, and you leave your check and you go home. Right? So there was a symbiosis going on that, that both sides appreciated. Um, no government, with the possible exception of Pakistan, actively aided the Arabs going, but some indirectly did. So Saudi Arabia gave them discounts on airlines, for example. Right? It was easy to give visa. Right? So there was some tacit state support. It wasn't huge, but there was some tacit state support going on, and a lot of money going into causes associated with these people. Right? So you might go as a young person to volunteer to be work at a hospital, and that hospital got a lot of funding, and it paid for your plane ticket, and uh, paid for you to be part of an organization, and while you were there, you fought. Right? So it's kind of half support, half not. OK. Um, I want to spend probably too much time on this particular slide, right? which is that when we talk about Qaeda, they're one group of many in this broader universe of jihadism. Right? And even jihadism, I mean, there are a whole host of different groups that could use that label, and there are debates on what jihad means, and are there peaceful interpretations or violent ones. But if you look at kind of the terrorist type of jihadist, right, the, the kind that we are most concerned about, even there, huge division. Right? So a big one is, um, are the governments where they live legitimate or not? Right? So in the 1980s, most of them would say, yeah, the governments are legitimate. Bin Laden didn't want to hear criticism of Saudi Arabia initially, because it was his government. Right? He thought it was legitimate. Right? He changes his mind pretty dramatically. But you have some jihadists who say, we want to fight you know, Jews in Israel. We want, want to fight Americans in Iraq, but not our own governments. And some are very direct against their own governments. Um, there is a question on, should we be fighting other kinds of Muslims? Right? And in particular, should we be fighting Shia Muslims? And some, like the Islamic State, would say they're the number one enemy. Right? They're the ones who are kind of, you know, this is true, I would say, let me back up. I grew up in a, a small town in the Midwest. Um, and if you ask most people in a small town in the Midwest, right, is someone who is in my town, it's a very religious town, um, is someone who lives in Egypt who is a Muslim going to go to hell? You would say, you know, it's kind of not their fault, right? Because they weren't raised going up to church with their family every day, right? They weren't exposed to God's word. So they may have some problems, but God is merciful and forgiving. And we'll recognize that. But if someone next door who did go to church with them every week suddenly says there is no God or converts to another religion, that's a different story, right? That it's the one who turns away from the faith that tends to be most hated and disliked. And many people see the Shia see other Muslims with a different interpretation of Islam as an enemy. Um, and that's not, by the way, what Al-Qaeda thinks. Right? But that's what a number of people in this broader movement thinks. Um, there's another question, which is, how do you use violence? Right? So we think of Al-Qaeda as 9-11. But a lot of what they do is they support groups that are rebelling against governments. Right? So they do guerrilla warfare, a lot of attacks on soldiers, a lot of attacks on police. So there are questions on how much can you attack civilians. And this is something that is, I will say, hotly debated in the jihadist circle. It's what we would call collateral damage. 
right? How much can you do military operations, allow civilians to die? How much should you deliberately target civilians? Um, another question, should you impose Islamic law? Right? Some groups, again, the Islamic State would say, yeah, you get in, you seize power, you force people to be good. Right? Al-Qaeda would say, no, you preach. Right? You get in, you seize power, and you use the power of education to, to teach people how to be good. So it's a very different interpretation of how you should govern in the role of religion. Um, and then, what do you do with people who work for the government? What do you do with people who have collaborated with your enemy? Right? So what we saw in Algeria in the 1990s were some of these groups said, anyone in society who's not with us is an enemy. And they're actually not just an enemy, they're, they're a false Muslim. So we have to kill them. Right? So they would kill huge numbers of civilians, their own people, uh, because they weren't on their side. Al-Qaeda would say that's crazy. Right? These are innocent people, we just need to educate them a bit. Um, so let's go to Al-Qaeda now. Right? This movement is founded as the Afghan war is ending. Right? So it comes out of the Afghan war, but that's not what it's about. Um, and a big thing they talk about is a vanguard. Right? And for those of you who you know, may remember kind of Marx and Lenin, they have the same idea. Right? Which is, you know, eventually the workers will unite and overthrow the capitalist system. But they could use a little help. Right? And that's where a small group of dedicated revolutionaries comes in. Right? And in this case, it's jihadists. Right? So Al-Qaeda, a couple hundred people. Um, what can they do? They can inspire people. They can serve as an example. They can be a spark that lights a broader fire. Right? So that's how they see a lot of their activities in this vanguard concept. Um, they would tell you that they hated America from the start. Initially, they're not focused on America. It takes about six years for that to happen. Right? Initially, they're very much about local conditions, the area. You know, Bin Laden says, you know, why would you kill Americans? Right? Most of them don't even vote. Right? They're not political. Right? It's like they're, they're not terribly important. Um, the last one I want to stress, because it sounds boring, but it's really important. Or a lot of what they're doing in their early days is training people, uh, identifying people who can forge passports, um, creating arms shipments to different places. And a uh, terms colleagues of mine used is uh, the quartermaster of jihad. Right? Where if there's a group in Egypt, there's a group in Algeria, there's a group in Libya, they're helping them all out. And that's really unusual for a terrorist group. Right? Terrorist groups tend to be kind of these cults of personality, where people are really all about themselves and how great the leader is. This is a group who's kind of stepping back and saying, we want to help you do your thing and you do your thing. It's, the, the way I would, I would think of it is imagine an American organization that wanted to support, say, liberal or conservative causes. Right? So they might train some volunteers, if you're, say, you know, on the liberal side, you might train some volunteers who do environmental activism. You might do some who are about unions. You might do some who are um, pro-choice, whatever the issues are. And you feel you're helping the broader cause. Right? And that's a lot of what Al-Qaeda did, was try to promote like-minded groups and ideas. Um, OK, they shift in the 1990s, right? And this it starts really around 94, but a big thing is they have a big public 1998 declaration that gets a lot of attention subsequently. Um, I have quotes there for kind of what bin Laden accuses the United States of, right? So one is we have troops in Saudi Arabia. And uh, there's a, a saying attributed to the Prophet Muhammad saying there shouldn't be non-Muslims in, in that area. Um, talks about the sanctions that were killing thousands of Iraqis and that um, you have support for Israel. Um, what I want to point out is every single one of those things is true. Right? They had some other ideas that were kind of more on the crazy side. But this isn't like, you know, oh my God, what were these people thinking, right? How could they possibly believe this, right? The United States supports Israel, right? Pretty proud of that, right? The United States at the time had troops in Saudi Arabia. It still has troops in, you know, nearby in Qatar. Um, and at the time, the United States was orchestrating a very tough sanctions regime in Iraq. Right? So these were grounded in very real U.S. policies. Right? But it's not about U.S. values. Right? Bin Laden gave a speech in, shortly before the 2004 election. And for those like me who are interested in it, it was fascinating because he was following the U.S. election debate very, very closely. 
right? And he was talking about the size of the supplemental appropriation, which, you know, I guarantee you most Americans were not following the size of supplemental appropriations in 2004. Um, and he, um, he said, look, we just want you to get out of the Middle East. Right? We're, we don't care about your values. We're not at war with Sweden. Right? Now, what I want to stress, though, is that a lot of the movement is at war with Sweden. A lot of the movement cares about things like women, women's rights or homosexual rights or freedom of religion. Right? So Al Qaeda is one strand of this movement, but only one strand. Um, but something that got a lot less attention is that the movement itself wasn't doing particularly well. So if you were looking at this movement in the early 1990s, you would say in Bosnia, in, um, in Egypt, in Algeria, these guys might win. Right? A couple years later, they had all lost. So terrorism is often a weapon of the weak. But in this case, so is going after the United States. And a lot of people in the movement said, why are you going after America? Right? You know, our enemy is the Egyptian government. Our enemy is the Algerian government. Why, why do you focus on this? But in a strange way, America was easier. Right? America is a superpower. It's got a global presence. you easy to find Americans. Right? If you have a big presence in Egypt, they all tend to get arrested or killed. Right? But in America, you can go around the world and try to find where they're weak. Right? So, um, well, I'm sorry. I think I put my slide slightly out of order. Yes, OK, so one thing I should have said um, is this shows up in 1998 when they bombed two US embassies in Africa, one in Tanzania, um, one in Kenya. Um, this is something that shows that this was a movement that, even though it was Afghanistan-based, was a global movement. Right? They had a presence in the Arab world we knew about. They had a presence in Afghanistan. But now they're in Africa. Right? What are they doing in Tanzania? Right? And it's unusual when you think about terrorist groups. They tend to be local. Right? That's how we've always thought about them. Right? You know, where do the Palestinians fight? Israel-Palestine. Right? And what made terrorism starting to be unusual in the 70s was we started to see people be more global. And Al-Qaeda took this one step further where they're more and more international. Um, and as they're international, they're starting to have international funding, right? So they're starting to get, they develop a large network of relief agencies that are largely fictitious. They get a lot of donations. They, it's a very kind of individual and organization-based donation process, where in the end, about $30 million a year is flowing into this group. Um, they're giving a lot of that money to the Taliban in Afghanistan. But it gives them a lot of money to fund their own operations. And the 1998 embassy bombings were a success for them in two ways. Right? One is they hit the United States hard. But the United States did a very, very bad response. Right? So if you recall, or some of you will recall, in 1998, uh, the United States launches cruise missiles um, at Sudan and at Afghanistan and uh, you know, hits a camp in Afghanistan and kills a few people. Uh, hits a, still debated, but hits a possible dual-use chemical plant in Sudan. But in general, doesn't do that much damage. And Al-Qaeda looks successful. And, and here's something that people often miss about terrorism and fighting the United States in general, which is you don't have to win to win. Right? So um, I don't follow boxing, so I don't even know who the boxing champion is. Right? But if I, if I step into the ring with the world champion in boxing, Right? I'm, I'm going to end up in the hospital. Right? That's not a question. Right? Uh, but if I step into the ring and get a good punch or two in and then end up in the hospital, you all are pretty impressed. Right? Like, I don't think any of you thinks I could actually do that. Right? Uh, now let's say I last three rounds and then end up in the hospital. And that's amazing. Right? So when Al Qaeda hits the United States and the United States does a weak response, people think Al Qaeda won. Right? They're not measuring the degree of the explosion. Right? They're thinking someone small took on someone big, and the small guy is still standing. Right? So they become much more popular, not because of the attack, but because of the US response. Um, and they continue to do anti-US terrorism. And it's in part because they're looking to exploit that US response. Right? And that's a truth about terrorism in general, which is it's usually the response that makes people a group popular, not the terrorist act itself. Okay, 9-11. Uh, as you know, you know, um, hits uh, four airplanes, devastating attack. Um, 
they are going after the symbols of American power, right? So the ultimate political symbol, the ultimate military symbol, and uh, the ultimate commercial symbols, right? So it's very symmetrical in some ways. So kind of a very clear logic to it. Um, there's different logics to it, right? One is, you know, if you hit the United States hard, America gives in, right? So, you know, under Reagan, his ball hit us hard in Lebanon. The United States blew some stuff up, ran away. Under Clinton, uh, we got hit hard in Mogadishu. We shot up a city street, killed a lot of people, ran away, right? Um, now, you can point to other examples where it's not true, but there was a story they had, which is if you hit the United States hard, it leaves. One. But if we don't leave, they still win, right? Because we go in, and then people in the Arab world have to choose, right? An enemy is at their gates, and they may not like the people who caused it, but now they have to decide, do they want to be with the United States? And Al-Qaeda was pretty confident they'd want to be with them. Um, also add to it, the United States was going to go into Afghanistan, right? And from Al-Qaeda's point of view, this was home turf. Right? They had beaten the Soviets here. Right? This is a good place to fight. And they felt like they could do a repeat. Right? This is kind of the war they wanted. And didn't quite work out the way they expected, but not quite the way America expected either. Right? It's not, Afghanistan is not a good news story anymore. Um, and so it's this idea of what we call propaganda of the deed, right? which is that you do something dramatic. Everyone pays attention to you. And that by paying attention to you, you grab your own constituents' attention, and you grab the enemy's attention. Um, and last, they also kind of wanted revenge. Right? In their eyes, the United States was responsible for hundreds of thousands of Muslim deaths. And this was a little payback. Right? So there's a lot going on with these attacks. OK. Um, initially, though, it does not work out well for them. Right? So uh, there's a jihadist who is kind of not an Al Qaeda member, but linked to this world named Abu Musab al Suri. And he said, you know, the 9-11 cast the jihadists into a fiery furnace, a hellfire which consumed most of their leaders, fighters, and bases. Right? So after 9-11, the United States goes into Afghanistan, seemingly by flicking its wrist, gets rid of the Taliban. Right? There were a couple years where Afghanistan seemed like a huge success, and the Taliban collapsed much more quickly than many observers anticipated. Right? So if you're Al-Qaeda, you've just lost your major supporter. You've just lost all your training camps. Um, and if you're all these other groups that were also in Afghanistan kind of working with Al-Qaeda, you've lost out too. Because the United States isn't thinking at this time, oh, this group isn't Al-Qaeda. It just trained in an Al-Qaeda camp, but it disagrees with them on how to treat Shia Muslims. We'll leave them alone. Right? The US view is let's just kill everyone or arrest everyone. Right, if you have any linkages, right, the US is casting a very wide net. So all these groups, even ones that disagree with Al-Qaeda, are being wrapped up. Um, but it's not just Afghanistan. Right? This is happening around the world. Right? And so if you think about the 9-11 plot itself, you know, I'll give you kind of a, a geographic synopsis. Right? It's some guys from Germany who want to go to Chechnya, but can't get there, so they go to Afghanistan and Pakistan. There they meet a guy from Saudi Arabia who directs them to do an attack on the United States. There is key funding from the United Arab Emirates, among other places, uh, from an account in the United Arab Emirates, I should say. Um, and there are important meetings in Spain and Malaysia. Right? Um, in all these countries, the governments aren't paying attention, including the United States. After 9-11, they're all paying attention. And simply by paying attention, it makes it much harder for these networks to operate. And around the world, you see networks arrested. Right? So there are massive, massive um, numbers of arrests and convictions everywhere for people who otherwise would have been ignored. Right? So there was kind of a lot of freedom of action that changes. Um, OK, what does Al-Qaeda do? Um, a lot of them go to Pakistan. Right? And we have this kind of pre-9-11 view of Afghanistan as the base for Al-Qaeda. Pakistan was also always the base. It's always an extensive presence in Pakistan. That's where they fought the Soviets from. That was the logistics base. That's where a lot of the funding was. That's where a lot of the training was. So they go back into Pakistan. Um, they are building camps, but it's not on the scale of Afghanistan. Right? And I want to stress this, which is in Afghanistan, they train, and there are uh, people training, the training camps in total, about 10 to 20,000 go through the camps in the 1990s. 
right? And from there, you can do a mini army, right? And that was because it could be open, right? You could have large scale camps. You could invite hundreds of people in, right? I mean, I'll just, I'll give you an example from, from this room without, without knowing uh, most of you. Um, how many people here speak a non-English language well? No one, my example is failing. Okay, uh, okay, uh, I'll ask a different question. Uh, how many people here are um, reasonably proficient with a firearm? With, with a gun? Okay, yeah, three, four. Um, and uh, anyone uh, know how to use explosives? I usually get one in a crowd. Nope, okay. Uh, what you're doing is you're sorting for skills, right? So if I need people who can use a gun, I now know three or four people, right? You're, and when you have thousands of people come in, you can say, this person speaks French, this person can use a gun, this person is pretty good at, you know, what's called crime, right, can forge a passport, and you put teams together, right? And that's what, that's what bureaucracies do when they work well. And so they're able to do that on a large scale. Um, because they're being hunted, because they're operating on a small scale in Pakistan, it's not happening there. But they still plan a number of terrorist attacks on the West, and you look at, the um, two of the deadliest attacks in this period, so the attacks in London in uh, July 2005 and the attacks in Madrid in uh, March 2004, and they both emanate from Al-Qaeda in Pakistan. And there is a debate on Pakistan, right? I'll say both these statements are true. One is that the Pakistani government is weak and doesn't have strong control over tribal areas, and when it tries to exercise control, it gets shot up, right? They've lost thousands of people. The other is Pakistan plays both sides. It's worked with a number of like-minded groups um, with Al-Qaeda. It's indirectly aided them, perhaps even directly. And it sees them as a weapon to use against India, as a form of influence in Afghanistan. And both those are probably true. The debate is about the degree to which each is true. Right? Is it more about weakness or is it more about that they want to help the jihadists? But either way, Al-Qaeda is reestablishing itself. Um, also important, though, there's a rebirth in Iraq. Um, Saddam Hussein had been an enemy of Al-Qaeda, right? So uh, this was something that was, <coughs> from Al-Qaeda's point of view, they were glad to see him go. Right? And we have a lot of, a lot of documents on this now. Um, and in 2003, before the invasion, Al-Qaeda is in a really tough spot, right? So they have two problems, right? One is a practical problem. They've been kicked out of Afghanistan. They're still weak in Pakistan. Um, and it's hard to, hard to train people, hard to get people to kind of be on your side. Uh, the other is an ideological problem, right? Which is, remember, they're a small group. And a lot of people were saying, um, look, we had an Islamic government. It was called the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan. And because of your actions, it got overthrown. And you guys say this is jihad. Right? This isn't jihad. The United States isn't doing much in the Middle East. Right? Jihad is like, you know, it's not when a Christian beats up a Muslim. Right? Jihad is when, you know, let's say hypothetically, uh, a major Christian or non-Muslim power invades and occupies a Muslim country. Right? And that's exactly what happened in 2003. Right? So bin Laden looks like a prophet. Right? He said, this is why we're going against the United States. Right? Because they're going to do exactly this sort of thing. Um, and so his people go in there, and they're able to pose as the defenders of the Sunni Muslim community there, right? They're able to say, you used to be the big dogs, but now you're being killed by a Shia government imposed by the United States. We can help you. So they get the community on their side. Um, and they establish a group that's called Al-Qaeda in Iraq, right? And we, later on, they become known as the Islamic State of Iraq, right? And that's going to be the germ of ISIS. Right, is this particular group that's established in, formally in 2004 that comes from Al-Qaeda. But Iraq is also a place to learn new skills and grab, and grab the attention of the world. So hundreds of people flock to Iraq, much more so than Afghanistan. So you get lots of new fighters coming in. They're learning new technology, like how to build better improvised explosive devices. Um, the suicide bombing used to be really rare. In Iraq, it becomes something that happens every day. Right, so you have a lot of new technologies and techniques that are spreading uh, through Iraq. <clears throat> um, and Al-Qaeda starts to look like they were the ones who were in the right, right after a lot of criticism. Uh, then they have some disaster. Um, one is that you have this group in Iraq, Al-Qaeda in Iraq, and it's controlled by this guy, Abu Musab al-Zarqawi, whose nickname is the Sheikh of the Slaughterers. 
right? And he's an incredibly brutal man, right? He's kind of the antithesis of bin Laden, right? He was a street thug, probably a pimp, you know, drug dealer who made his reputation in prison and was a fighter, right? And bin Laden is an organizer and kind of a leader. And, and Zarqawi rises by being a fighter. Um, and he makes his reputation uh, by personally beheading Western suspects and then videotaping it. And this is just when the internet can start to handle video, right? So if he had done this in 2000, it would have been very hard. But by 2003, you can have internet on, you can have video on the internet. And so millions of people are downloading his beheading videos, right, where he himself is personally doing it. Um, and it's incredibly compelling. I'd love to tell you it wasn't. Right? So a lot of people are attracted to it, and there's a sense that the United States is pushing Muslims around, and here's a guy fighting back. Right? And um, what they do, though, is they're so brutal, and their view is, uh, Zarqawi's view is, bin Laden, you know, the United States is bad, but not as bad as the Shia. Right? Remember those disagreements I was, I was kind of going on about? It's a big disagreement. So the real problem is the Shia, the real problem are Muslims who are on our side, they're the number one enemy. And so what they plan to do is they say, we're going to start a war with the Shia. And when they do that, all the Sunnis are going to be victimized by the Shia. And they're going to turn to us as their protector. And that works, except the Shia win. Right? So it's one of those okay, you picked a fight, but the, you're picking a fight with a pretty strong set of groups. And the groups become stronger and stronger, and thousands, tens of thousands, over 100,000 Iraqis die in the Civil War. And in general, the Shia community is victorious, right? It's, it's not 100%, but it's, it's pretty strong. Um, but they also start going after ordinary Sunni Muslim Iraqis who don't agree with them, right? And they start to kill them, they start to torture them, uh, they're going after tribal figures, and it's often foreigners coming in who are kind of attracted by the fight, but who will see someone who, um, in, the, um, in the tradition of the jihadists, one of the things that they have a very strong interpretation of is what they would call tawhid, which is the oneness of God. Right? It's, it's, it's called extreme monotheism, right? which we don't think of as being extreme, but in this context it can be. right. So the idea would be, um, there was only one God, and if you're praying at your relative's grave, do you think your relative is holy? Right? That's idolatrous, right? There's one God, right? Anything, any symbol of religion, anything like that is idolatrous because there's one God. And there are a lot of kind of folk religious customs that almost every country has, and these guys are going after, right? So they're destroying graveyards. Right? They're doing lots of things that are alienating local communities. Um, and around the world, you start to see religious leaders who in the past had kind of supported these guys because they were fighting America and no one liked the invasion of Iraq, now start to denounce these guys. Right? So sometimes you get kind of, you know, it's hard to believe these things happen, but Ayman Zawahiri did a web chat. Right? So it goes online, like, you know, um, uh, ask me questions, right, the way I might to prospective Georgetown students, right? So he does a web chat. And a lot of the questions are, how come you're killing children in Iraq? Right? What's wrong with you? Right? So, and these are questions from other jihadists, right, who are disagreeing with the level of violence they are doing. Um, 2009, you have the director of the CIA say they're on the verge of strategic defeat. Um, 2009, 2010, probably 70, 80 percent of their senior leadership is killed or arrested. Right? So it looks like these guys are gone. Right? They're ideologically discredited. They're organizationally disrupted. For those of you who know um, General Stan McChrystal, his organization does an amazing job kind of wiping out this group. Right? It's really impressive. So they're kind of gone, right? or so we think. Right? And by this time, remember, what we're going to call them, I, I use al-Qaeda in Iraq for clarity, but the correct term would be the Islamic State of Iraq. Okay. Um, what we have with al-Qaeda in Iraq is an example, and I'm going to veer here a bit, of something that became very important to al-Qaeda in general after um, 2001, which is it began to establish affiliates. And so it had groups in the Maghreb, al-Qaeda of the Islamic Maghreb. Um, it worked with a group in India, al-Qaeda um, of the Indian subcontinent. It uh, worked with the Shabaab in Somalia. Um, so you have 
different places where it's active. Um, it works with uh, Jamaa Islamiyah in Indonesia, I could go on, right? So it's active. Now, what I always hate about these maps is sometimes like this group might be like 50 people, right? So if I were to say, you know, uh, where are white supremacists active in the United States and did a state-by-state -state map, the whole America would be covered, right? But that doesn't mean white supremacists are dominating every community, right? So there are small parts of each of these countries. But all that said, that's a lot, right? So we went from this group in Afghanistan of a couple hundred people that was launching attacks from Afghanistan to a group that's active around the world, often focusing on local issues, but really trying to spread itself through its affiliates. Um, and if you look at major Al-Qaeda attacks, not all of them, but a lot of them are affiliates. Right, so in, in Bali, in Jordan, in Egypt, um, in Kenya, in the Charlie Hebdo attacks in Paris in 2015, um, you have significant numbers of people dying done by Al Qaeda affiliates. Uh, so going back to that question I raised on the first slide of what this group is, it's a really tough one, right? Because there's the group Ayman Zawahiri controls, and then there are these little groups all around the world, some of which are acting, some of which are not. And they kind of count, and they kind of don't. Um, a few generalizations about these affiliates. Um, most of them are primarily local or regional, and they're fighting insurgencies against their own governments. Right? So they're doing guerrilla war. They want to overthrow their government. Sometimes it's regional, so they might want to take out their government and the one next to them. But they're usually not thinking globally. Um, some use terrorist tactics, but only a few do terrorism outside their region. Um, they be, usually become more regional and especially become more anti-Western in their region. But this is a dilemma for U.S. counterterrorism because there are two ways to look at this. One is there's an Al-Qaeda group active. Let's go find them and kill them. Right? So let's work with the local government. Let us um, send our own troops. We can send drones. Another is you know they're focused locally, and that's too bad. But my children will be fine. Right? That's not our problem, right? The United States doesn't have to be everywhere in the world. And so the question is, if you ignore them, will they just get stronger and stronger and then come back to kill you? Right? So is this, you know, do you want to let them grow as they did in Afghanistan? Or if you engage them, do you say, OK, they're locally focused, but now they're going to be mad at the United States, and they're going to actually turn into a much more direct enemy? Um, so why do these groups affiliate? Uh, Al-Qaeda, and we could say the Islamic State, I just threw it in there because it's the same issue. Part of it is that it wants to be the leader of the jihadist world, this kind of vanguard concept that they're the ones who will be leading the group. Um, and a big thing, though, is they want to kind of encourage other groups to be like them. I mentioned this kind of variation in content about how all these groups believe different things. They want to kind of push a model on them. Um, it makes them relevant, right? So they can do operations in parts of the world where before they couldn't. Um, and so there's a lot of benefit. Uh, from the affiliate point of view, there sometimes is genuine conviction, but a lot of times the affiliate's own brand is bad, right? So they fought a war and they're losing, and they want to kind of change their image, right? So um, Al Qaeda and the Islamic Maghreb grew out of basically grew out of a group that grew out of a group that grew out of a group that grew out of a group, right? But the initial group was formed by Afghan veterans. And they were the ones that made their names kind of killing and torturing ordinary people because they thought they were false Muslims. When Al-Qaeda representatives showed up to that group in the 90s saying, hey, we're here to help, they killed them. Right? Um, the group morphs over time, but they have a really bad brand, right? Algerians start to hate these guys. So they say, oh, we're, we're Al-Qaeda, right? We have a different brand. We're going after different things. And when, when Al-Qaeda is involved in Iraq, for example, that makes the brand more appealing. So there's a desire to change their image. But a big risk for all these guys is this question of the United States being their enemy. Right? So when the Shabab starts to work more with Al-Qaeda figures, uh, then the Shabab starts to attract US attention. The United States begins to fund uh, clan enemies of them. Uh, for those of you interested, there's a, a very funny memoir written by an American who goes and volunteers for the Shabab in Somalia, a jihadist who volunteers. But he's a really funny guy. Um, and he, um, I, the, uh, he ends up being killed by the, by the Shabab, in fact. But he, um, 
he says, drones in Somalia are racist. Right? They only kill white people, right? Because they're going after the foreigners, right? Uh, the United States doesn't care about the Somalis as much, right? So if you're a local group and you bring the foreigners in, you have to worry about lots of things. Okay. Um, here are some problems, right? And we, this is what we saw in Iraq. Um, first of all, you're trying to run an organization from far away, right? And that's a really hard thing to do. And it's hard in general, right? For any of you who have been involved in organizations that are multinational. It's just hard to, you're on a different time zone, people have different local concerns, or language barriers, all these problems. But imagine you're kind of running from building to building every night, trying to sleep somewhere different. It's hard to communicate because you're afraid your phone might give you away. It's very hard to control your organization. And we have a lot of records from these groups, and they're always complaining about control. They're saying, you know, we're trying to get them to do what we want, but they're, they're telling us to jump in a lake, right? They're just ignoring what we want them to do. So um, with Al-Qaeda in Iraq, uh, the head of Al-Qaeda is saying to them, look, you're too violent. And stop going after the Shia. Go after the Americans. Stop beheading people. Right? Don't do that stuff. Right? And Al-Qaeda in Iraq just ignores them. Right? So it's hard to control them, but you've given them your name. Right? So, you know, the analogy I often use, right, is if, if McDonald's just went around giving, um, you know, restaurants its name, and then one restaurant decides to have, you know, it has a problem with rats and bugs, that affects the whole brand, right? But what if McDonald's can't do anything about that one restaurant, right? And it keeps advertising itself as McDonald's, right? That was the problem Al Qaeda had, is it wasn't able to control its people. And in Iraq, we started to see the group become much more of a rival. Right? It takes on its own momentum. Um, okay, let me talk about Syria, which is kind of the key feeder for jihad today in all these groups. Um, so we have this group in Iraq, I called it Al-Qaeda in Iraq, then I called it the Islamic State of Iraq. Um, and when the Syria war breaks out, uh, first of all, remember this group is, is almost defeated, right? It's been kind of hit really hard. And then also, uh, this group uh, now has an opportunity to regroup next door in Syria. Right? And so all of a sudden the Syrian border is open. They were getting supplies from individuals in Syria in the past, so they have a lot of networks in there. Um, and Syria is exciting. That's where the Arab world is focusing its attention. So they begin to reestablish themselves in Syria in part because no one's shooting at them there. Right? In Iraq, people are shooting at them. In Syria, they're not, because the government is focused on the moderate opposition. Right? And this is something that most people <coughs> don't get how horribly cynical the Syrian government is. Um, the group that becomes the Islamic State, the jihadists, they hate the Syrian government. And the Syrian government would happily kill all of them. Right? So there's no like-minded commonality there. But they have a common enemy, which is the more moderate opposition. Right, so if you go back to 2012, 2013, the Syrian government thought it was going to lose power because people were demonstrating in the streets. And groups that were backed by countries like Turkey or Qatar or Saudi Arabia, um, that they were going to beat it militarily. Right? So there's a whole range of actors in the middle that they were afraid of. So what do they do? They try to change their opposition. So they released jihadists from jail. Sounds kind of crazy, right? But then they could say, you see the other side? They're a bunch of jihadists. Right? Uh, they create militias that go into Sunni Muslim areas. And the militias kill people and torture people. Sunni Muslim groups, in response, go into minority areas and kill and torture them. And then they say to their minority constituents who were about to give up on them, see the other side? They're a bunch of brutal killers. Right? So they're creating a dynamic. They create a sectarian dynamic. They create a terrorist dynamic where it didn't exist. But it's real once it's created. Right? It's not something it can turn off. Um, so the Syrian regime, when they first come in, isn't shooting at them. Right? So both sides are going after the moderate opposition. Um, so this is a huge success. You have a group which uh, we uh, call Jabhat al-Nusra, which is the affiliate there. And all of a sudden, jihadists around the world want to join this group, right? The Syria cause is front and center. They're very excited about this, um, getting lots and lots of recruits. Um, money starts to pour in. Uh, but there's a question, right? So Jabhat al-Nusra, it comes from the Islamic State of Iraq. 
So is it subordinate to the Islamic State of Iraq? Or is it subordinate to Al Qaeda? Right? And the Islamic State of Iraq, because this group is actually now more successful in some ways than the Islamic State of Iraq appears to be, says it's subordinate to us. Right? And in fact, we're going to now call ourselves not the Islamic State of Iraq, but the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, or ISIS. Right? And Jabhat al-Nusra's leaders say no. Right? We're actually not subordinate to you guys. We're subordinate to al-Qaeda. And al-Qaeda agrees with Jabhat al-Nusra, and they split. Right? So this group splits, and a lot of the fighters actually end up going to what we call ISIS. Right? So this is a success in Syria, but it's also a jihadist civil war in Syria where they start shooting at each other as ISIS is declared. Um, very briefly on the Islamic State, right? which is, what does it want? Right? It wants a caliphate, it wants to govern, and if you, their view is you create an st as, as Islamic State and you impose it, um, every other group has to work with it. They're the state. right? So rival groups should just lay down their arms and accept the Islamic State's authority. Um, the enemy should be in Syria. They would say it's the Alawi regime, which is kind of like the Shia. It's a little more complex, but a minority, religious minority regime. Um, and they have this theme of the apocalypse, that the apocalypse is nigh, and they're recruiting on those grounds. Um, they're extremely violent, right? And they're openly proud of that violence, right? So lots of beheadings, lots of torture, and they're disseminating video about this. Um, Al-Qaeda, to be clear, doesn't favor any of this. Right? So this is a group with a lot of Al-Qaeda roots, but very different from what Al-Qaeda wants. Right? Al-Qaeda does want a caliphate, but its view is way down the road. Right? It does favor killing people, but different people. Right? There's a whole, there are big differences here. Um, OK. Uh, you have, over time, the Al-Qaeda group changes its name multiple times. And now we call it um, Hayat Tawher Hasham. Um, which is, uh, it separates from Al-Qaeda, right? So even the, the group that stayed low to Al-Qaeda now says, we don't want to be associated with Al-Qaeda, right? And why is that? Because the United States has said to local actors, and its allies have said to local actors, if you work with this group, we're not going to support you. So therefore, the local groups don't want to work with them. And these guys want to work with the local groups. So they separate. It's actually a real, it's both a, Obama and now a Trump administration counterterrorism success is getting groups to reject and make this group somewhat of a pariah. Um, and they say, we're not focused on the United States. We're focused on Syria. Um, and they're trying to work with other Syrian groups. This is a problem for Syria's future, but it's not anti-Western terrorism. right? It's a very different challenge and how we should think about this. OK, um, a few notes on counterterrorism. I want to check my time. Excuse me one second. <coughs> okay. Uh, a few notes on counterterrorism. Um, in general, what has worked very well going after Al Qaeda is going through is working with allies, right? And this is something that's almost always missed, even by people who follow counterterrorism, is that the key role on a day-to-day -day basis is allies. And I don't mean this. There's kind of a general sense in international relations that allies are good, and I believe that. But here I'll just say, just think of the practical issue, right? Which is um, if there was a terrorist operating in Madrid, right, uh, the CIA can send a team to the city. They can try to locate that terrorist. They can surveil him, you know, uh, try to tap his phone, swoop in. They can do all that. Or they can call up the Spanish police who arrest him. Right? It's illegal to be a terrorist. Right? And the Spanish police go up, knock on his door, and arrest him, and take all his stuff away. Right? And what it means is all of a sudden you have tens of thousands of people around the world who are acting to help the United States for counterterrorism. And the US role is to be the global conductor of an intelligence orchestra. So go back to that kind of individual in Spain. right? They arrest him. Uh, they think he's a suspected terrorist. They find his phone. He's been calling a lot to Morocco, called the Moroccan government. Right? They find that he got a bank transfer from Saudi Arabia, called the Saudi government. They investigate the bank account, and they find they arrest individuals, <coughs> and those individuals are linked to people um, in France. Right? They look at where money has gone, and you're, you have a giant puzzle. And now you're putting all the pieces together. Right? And so the vast majority of counterterrorism is 
very boring arrest and surveillance that occur in the background. Um, there are some problems, though. Right? One is that when you say what matters to the United States is terrorism, other countries are going to stress their own terrorism problems to put themselves on the same page as the United States. So before 9-11, Russia had a problem in Chechnya with bandits. Right? After 9-11, it had a problem in Chechnya with terrorists. Right? Egypt does something similar today with a lot of its domestic opposition. Um, also, when you are working with allied intelligence services, you're often giving them money, you're giving them support. Um, and what you're doing is you're aiding the least democratic part of an undemocratic regime. Right? So if you're working with Egypt to fight genuine terrorism in Egypt, which is a real thing, uh, the Egyptian government also uses that money to go after democratic dissent. Right? It's, it's the same intelligence service. And so the United States is strengthening undemocratic actors in many countries. Um, and for those of you who have been to the Middle East or know the Middle East, there's kind of a, a strange correlation, or inverse correlation, I should say, which is the more the government likes and works with the United States, the more the people tend to hate us. Right? So in the broader Middle East, you know, Jordan, uh, Morocco, Egypt, public opinion polls of the United States you know, are kind of way, way down there, right? They're close to the levels of like American support for the US Congress, right? So we're in the single digits in lots of countries, right? Really low figures. Um, which country in, in the greater Middle East is the United States relatively popular with the people, according to polls? You know? Israel. Uh, I'm sorry, Israel is obvious, I apologize for that. Um, which Muslim country in the Middle East is the United States relatively popular? Saudi nope, they hate us there. Iran. Why? Because in Iran, the United States is not on the side of tyranny. Right? We're opposed to tyranny. We hate the Iranian government. Right? And we point out their human rights abuses and all their problems. Saudi Arabia, we're on the side of tyranny. Right? So if you're in the Middle East, you're looking around, you're saying, well, I don't really like my government. The United States seems to like them. You draw some conclusions. Right? So the United States, it's, there's a lot going on for why the United States is unpopular. But one reason is, in the Middle East, we're not on the side of freedom. Right? We're pretty openly not on the side of freedom. Um, the last thing I'll say is probably the biggest, though, which is, remember I said there's kind of you know, intelligence cooperation in all these countries, Morocco and France and Spain, and everything's going great. There are some countries where it doesn't work. Right? So some countries, let's say Yemen, the Yemeni government controls its capital on a good day during daylight. Right? Like that's a successful day for the Yemeni government. Right? So if you say to the Yemeni government, you know, could you arrest this guy in, you know, in the hinterlands? They can't. Um, Pakistan, we're still not quite sure what side Pakistan's on. Right? Sometimes they cooperate with US counterterrorism. A, a friend of mine who was in the intelligence community put it this way. He said, uh, I am convinced that um, when I met with my Pakistani counterparts, they were working with me very sincerely to fight terrorism. I'm also convinced that farther down in the office building, there was another group of Pakistani intelligence having a similar meeting with a terrorist group, helping them out. Right? And weak states hedge their bets. Right? If you're Pakistan, you want to work with the United States, but you also want to have some other options. Um, OK, another success, as I mentioned, is removing this haven in Afghanistan. <coughs> um, what I want to stress is that last point, which is even if the Taliban come back, that doesn't mean it's going to be a haven as it was before 9-11. Right? Because part of the reason it was a haven before 9-11 was because no one was really paying attention to it. And now people will still be paying attention to it, even if the United States ends up not being there. And part of it is because of the US drone program. Right? Uh, when I was on the 9-11 commission, one of the big questions we often had was, uh, you know, why didn't the United States kill bin Laden? Right? And you know, there were multiple times the 9-11 Commission report indicates the CIA had him in his sights. Why didn't when they do it, right? Um, OK, a few things, right? First of all, some of the times the CIA thought they had him in his sights, they probably didn't. Right? And if you've, some of you may have background on this, but in general, um, a lot of intelligence information is just bad information. So you want multiple sources. Right? You don't go off and say, oh, you know, one person said this, it must be true, and rush off. Right? You want to get a lot of uh, information from different sources. So <clears throat> one problem that the government had was they didn't have many sources. Um, another problem was time. 
right? So let me give you a scenario, right? So a trusted CIA agent sitting around the campfire is like, oh my God, that's Bin Laden, right? So he, you know, rushes off to go to the bathroom, picks up his secret phone, calls his CIA handler, the CIA handler calls the head of the CIA, who calls the national security advisor, who wakes up the president. The president gets his security council together. They decide to kill this guy. They order the Navy to do a cruise missile strike from offshore in Pakistan. It's pre-9-11, that's probably how it would have been done. Um, let's say, charitably, that process takes 12 hours. And if you know anything about your government, that would be like medals all around, right? Like I've just given you the best, most efficient government meetings ever, right? Um, so the question is actually not, where's Bin Laden? The question is, where will Bin Laden be in 12 hours? Right? And that's a really hard question, right? Especially because in Afghanistan, uh, there were families there, there were kids there, right? And remember, pre-9-11, people aren't thinking thousands of deaths, right? They're thinking dozens. So you want a lot of information. So how does the, uh, the drone program change this? A couple things. Uh, one is, it gives you another source of information, right? We have a report that Bin Laden's sitting by the campfire. Okay, you know, get the drone, right? Take a picture. Um, there was also a lot of other gear attached to it that helped. Um, if you want to kill him, you know exactly where he is, right? It's, it's seconds rather than hours. Uh, also, the warhead on the drone is relatively small, so you're not going to blow up everything, right? You'll still blow up some stuff, but it's going to be much more, much more finite. Um, and so we have a lot of Al-Qaeda records where they talk about the chaos, right? For those of you who have been in your business, right? Imagine every three months your boss is removed, right? And you get a new boss, right? Maybe the first few times that boss is pretty good, but eventually you're going to get someone who doesn't know what they're doing because they just don't have the experience, right? So there's constant churn. Uh, but Al-Qaeda kind of figures it out, right? So we have an Al-Qaeda tip sheet, which is how to avoid a drone attack. It's pretty good advice. Right, so you don't gather in a large group, right? So not this meeting, right? Uh, you don't talk on the phone. Don't get on the internet. Be very careful about who you trust. There are spies everywhere, right? It's good advice. But if you actually listen to it, you can't run an organization, right? You can't run a training camp. You can't, all these affiliates, you can't call them. You can't tell them what to do. So you have a choice, which is you can exercise command and die or not exercise command and live, but the groups do their own thing, right? So the drone program has been very, very effective, but there are a few problems, right? So one is they, they kill innocent people. I don't know how many, right? And that's a tough question. We have two sources of information. Uh, one is the Pakistani government, which deliberately manipulates information to inflate the, the death count and feeds it to selected reporters and organizations and inflates it. The other is the US government, which leaks information about how few people die but they use very bad methods. So I have two sources that I don't particularly rely on. And in most parts of Pakistan in particular, no one gets in or out, right? They're not letting reporters in to, to study this problem. Um, so we know innocent people are dying. I don't know how many. Um, another problem, uh, this is not my term, I'm borrowing from a, a guy named Dave Kilcullen, who's one of the great theorist practitioners of counterinsurgency. And he calls it counterinsurgency math. Right, which is, you know, there are 10 guys charging me in a normal war and I kill two of them. I have eight to deal with, right? But in insurgency, there are 10 guys fighting me, I kill two of them. Maybe I have 20 to deal with because their cousin and their brother are now really angry at me, right? That I've alienated a whole tribe, right? So a question for drones is when you kill innocent people, how much do you bring in other people, right? And my, my personal sense, and I want to stress the lack of empirics on this, is that it's better in Pakistan for the United States because most of the people, a lot of people are foreigners. And so you don't have those networks. But in Yemen, when we go after Pakistanis in Pakistan, which we do, then you start to bring in broader networks with more complex dynamics. Um, and the last thing I'll say is, um, there's an Israeli term in counterterrorism, they would say is mowing the grass, right? Which is you have a problem, you know, in this case, the grass is too high. You mow it, so you kill people, you reduce the problem. But next week, you still have to mow the grass. Right? You don't solve the problem with killing people, right? But the Israelis would also say, you know, look, for a week, the grass is pretty good, right? And okay, we'll just continue this, right? It's not ideal, but until you give me a better option, I'm going to mow the grass. Um, okay, uh, talk about dangers at home. Um, since 
in the United States, roughly slightly over 100 people have died from jihadist terrorist attacks in the United States. Okay, now let me stress this. That's, that's 100 people to me, and these are innocent people, right? So this is, this is horrible. Uh, however, if you had asked me on September 12, 2001, and I think if you had asked most people in government, they would have said, oh my God, I thought the figure would be in the thousands. Right? I thought it would be much, much worse. And in fact, that 100 number is actually much smaller than people who died in the pre-9-11 era in the United States. Right? One attack, the Oklahoma City bombing, killed more than all this combined. Right? So it's been a much safer 16 years than people anticipated when 9-11 happened. Um, a couple things to say. Uh, those in the United States are often incompetent. Right? And so um, there are a couple plots that got a lot of attention. Right? So one was a man wanted to uh, destroy the Brooklyn Bridge. Pretty scary. Right? I think he planned to do it with an ax. Right? If you've ever seen the Brooklyn Bridge, right? that's, that's not going to happen. Right? So it sounds scary. But then you realize, oh, he was going to do it with an ax. Right? Um, there was another case. I'm, I'm, a lot of my clan is from Chicago, where they're going to destroy the Willis Tower in Chicago, the, the Sears Tower. And um, <coughs> What was it? It's a bunch of guys in Miami sitting around smoking pot. And they kind of talk big. And their plan was to kind of uh, blow up the tower. It would fall into Lake Michigan. And the ensuing tsunami would wipe out most of the lakefront. Um, a few minor points, right? Um, one is, first of all, towers don't fall, right? They crumble, right? Unless they're made of Legos, right? So it's not going to fall. Um, two, um, there wouldn't be a tsunami. I think we can agree on that. Um, and then three, the Willis Tower is not on the lake. Right? It's actually just not where it is. Um, and so these guys were completely incompetent, um, but got a lot of attention. Right? And part of why they're incompetent, though, is they can't train. Right? And it's very hard for them to go somewhere else to train. Well, pre-9-11, it wasn't. Right? So pre-9-11, Ayman Zawahiri, the head, current head of al-Qaeda, came to the United States to fundraise. Right? That's not going to happen. Right? Americans were going back and forth where no one really cared that much because it wasn't seen as a big problem. Right? Uh, let me give you an example. Uh, uh, how many of you have ever put, put together an IKEA piece of furniture? Um, of those who have, how many of you messed it up? OK, now imagine that's a bomb, right? which is, I'm guessing, it's not that you're not smart enough to put together an IKEA piece of furniture. Right? It's that you're not smart enough to do it without a little help the first time. Right? So if you can be trained in putting together IKEA pieces of furniture, you'll master it after class one. But if you've never been trained, you might mess it up. Right? And when you mess up a bomb, it has big consequences. And so for the most part, most Al-Qaeda people have, in the United States, I shouldn't say, most jihadist people, have not been able to put together a bomb in the United States. Right? And remember, 1972 saw several hundred bombings in New York City alone. Right? So that's a high degree of incompetence, right? that they haven't been able to put together a bomb. Um, most of them don't know anything about Islam. Right? So there are a lot of studies that show that greater religious knowledge is actually some degree of inoculation for being an extremist. Right? And if you think about that, that can make a lot of sense. Right? Because if I could select five verses from the Bible to show you that Jesus Christ favored killing people, Right? And I think most of you who know, you know anything about Christianity know that's, that's not an accurate interpretation. But if you knew nothing and I gave you those five verses, you might nod your head. Right? And so it's easy to manipulate someone who is religiously unschooled. And so that's been a huge issue. Um, <clears throat> the local community in general in the United States has worked extremely well with law enforcement. Right? Almost half the US deaths came from one attack which was the Pulse nightclub attack in Orlando that killed 49 people. Um, in that attack, uh, members of the local Muslim community called the FBI and said, there's something going on with this guy. Right? He's, this is bad. Right? And the FBI interviewed him and didn't stop him. But that wasn't on the community. Right? And there are huge numbers of cases where individuals have been arrested or disrupted because of the community support. Um, and the last thing I'll say on the US is you have an extremely aggressive FBI. Right? And the FBI is using lots of confidential informants and prosecuting lots of cases that, in the past, these plots might not have gone anywhere. 
right? And the FBI's point would be, look, you told us after 9-11 to disrupt plots, right? So the fact that someone's saying, I want to kill Americans, and is serious enough to actually take a few steps down the road, we're going to stop that person, right? So even if a lot of those guys never would have gotten more than a few steps, we're going to stop them. But it's a much more aggressive FBI response. Um, and it's got a lot of criticism, not only from civil liberties circles, but also from some judges who feel they've been going a bit too far. Um, OK. Uh, I'm sorry, one last thing I should say on, on this, which is there's also been a huge change in resources. Right? So if I were talking about the American counterterrorism community focused on jihadism before 9-11, I'd probably be talking about the people in this room. Right? You know, 40 people, 50 people, a lot depends on what you count, but a small number. If I were talking about today, we're talking basically a large football stadium, right? Tens of thousands of people. So there's been a huge, massive resource shift in people focused on counterterrorism. And maybe it's too much, but it's certainly paid off in terms of being able to do a lot more than in the past. Uh, <clears throat> a few implications to consider. Uh, one is intelligence, right? I mentioned the kind of importance of that cooperation. You got to keep that going. It's relatively cheap. It's relatively straightforward. Um, social media. Uh, social media, I think there's a kind of a bad story out there. Um, social media is great for terrorist groups like the Islamic State uh, because they, it's very cheap. They can communicate with lots of people. And also, they can individualize their message. Right? It's much more compelling when you're talking to a small group <laughs> that says, oh, you really care about the Shia. Well, you really care about living in an Islamic State, whatever it is be tailored. Um, however, social media is an intelligence analyst dream. Right? When I worked in government, a lot of what you'd spend time on was trying to figure out you know, if, if these two people knew each other. Right? You know, we think they grew up in the same neighborhood, but did they overlap? I don't know. Right? Now, if, if I know your Facebook friends and your Twitter followers and your Instagram followers, I kind of know everything about your social network. Right? So a lot of people are revealed who wouldn't have been uncovered before. Right, <clears throat> because they're following some known jihadist. And for a lot of these people, when they first join up, they don't think they're joining a clandestine terrorist group. They think they're joining the jihadist equivalent of the Marines. And you want to brag to your buddies about this. Right? So you know we have cases where you know, in Facebook, people will say one of their likes is jihad, or they'll put up an Islamic State flag on Facebook. right? And then one of their you know, 500 fake friends um, calls the FBI, right, and that's it, right? So social media are very dangerous for these groups. Um, I'm personally very upset by the kind of anti-Muslim rhetoric that's been more common in the United States in the last couple of years. Um, putting aside whether, kind of my own feelings about that as an American, it's a counterterrorism disaster. Um, you want communities to feel comfortable working with government, right? And we see this in parts of Europe where they're very suspicious of government and as a result, are less willing to work with their own intelligence services, right? So if you think about it, right, if my, my next door neighbor is torturing puppies, right, I'm going to call the police, right? And I'm not an informant, right? I'm just a citizen trying to stop something bad, right? We don't use the word informant in that sense, right? We would say citizen. And we want people to say, oh, there's a bad person next door. I'm going to call the police, as opposed to I'm nervous about the police. I don't trust them. That person may be bad, but the police are bad too. You want that sort of harmony. Um, two failures that I think are pronounced, and I'll, <coughs> I'll stop on this note. Um, one is, a um, number of you are kind of my age, but there are some younger people in this audience. For the, for the younger people, I'll say, uh, many years ago in the United States, we had this institution that was very important for national security. Right? And uh, it was called the US Congress. Right? It was a really important thing, right? And it did something really impressive, right? It, it would pass laws. Um, and Congress doesn't do that anymore, right? And this is not a Congress today, right? This is post 9-11, Democrats control Congress, Republicans control Congress, right? This is both sides. Um, and if you think about counterterrorism since 9-11, right? We have detention in Guantanamo, we've had torture, we've had um, use as a military force outside the original context. We have the drone program. We have aggressive wiretapping. Um, I suspect, and frankly, I'm hoping, people in this room disagree about those things. Um, and usually, that's resolved through legislation. Right? And it takes years to get government programs up and running. 
And what you don't want is there's a new president in, let's change all the programs. Right? So when you think about presidents um, Bush, Obama, and Trump, you know, this is a, a daring statement, right? I'm going to say they're different people, right? These are not three peas in a pod, right? These are three very different folks. And you don't want counterterrorism to change that dramatically. You want some degree of continuity, and that comes through legislation. <coughs> and Congress has been AWOL. Um, the last thing I'll say is a failure of resilience at home, right? Um, again, I want to stress 100 innocent deaths is, is 100 too many. But Americans are extremely unlikely to die from terrorism at home. Right? Um, you know, if you look at big killers, right, like heart disease or car accidents, right, uh, it's you know, tens of thousands every year. But even things like you know, being struck by lightning is far more likely than dying from terrorism. Um, you're more likely to be shot by an armed toddler than dying from terrorism, right? So the terrorism um, risk is extremely low, yet we are actually more afraid of terrorism than we were 10 years ago, right, with very little reason to be. And that to me is very upsetting. I think we as a kind of, you know, people like me who work on it, politicians have done a relatively bad job of trying to articulate dangers. And there's a, there's a, it's hard when there's a, these are very scary groups. But I feel that it would be better for the United States if we said it's a risky world out there and lived our lives rather than kind of obsessed about relatively uh, low probability dangers at home. So with that, let me stop and I will take uh, questions, disagreements, comments, and so on, please.